Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What can I do for you? Yes, I see. Can I ask what kind of places do you go to? Certainly. Well, usually there are excursions to the city. There are many interesting cultural venues to see, such as theatres and art museums. We also organise trips to the local mountains for hiking, or sometimes even to discount shopping areas around here. We don't organise guided tours, since most students like to explore on their own. How far away are they usually? Well, it's a good thing the city is not too far south of here, since most of the excursions we organise go there. They are never more than two hours away. And so, how much do I have to pay for each excursion? Oh, the great thing is that the transportation is free. You pay for just entrance fees and the like, or for whatever you buy. That sounds great. Yes, and for certain events, like theatre shows, you can get a discount on tickets when you buy them through the school. Oh, really? So how do I buy discounted tickets? When we travel to the venue, you will be given a discount at the box office or the ticket booth if you show your school identification card. You can also purchase tickets beforehand for you and your friends from the university website at the discounted price. All right. What part of the website is it? Well, log on to the university website with your ID number. Right. The login screen on the main page. There will be a section called Campus Activities on the navigation bar on the left side. In that section, there is another link for off-campus excursions. The monthly schedule is shown there, and there is also an online form to purchase any discount tickets available. Nice. Thanks for the advice. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. So, yeah, my computer is down. Can I ask you what excursions there are this month? Yeah, it's the beginning of the school year, so the new schedule isn't up on the website yet. But I have the schedule here on my computer. We have all the dates confirmed, and when the site is updated, you'll be able to buy discount tickets from there. Thanks. I am pretty busy during the week, so maybe you could just tell me about some of the next few ones coming up on the weekends. Definitely. The weekend before October break, there is a bus going to Big River Valley Park. That's the... let me see... that's the 12th. This is a hiking trip to see fall foliage, so there will be a small entrance fee of $11 to enter the park. It's a six-hour excursion. Oh, wonderful. The fall colors are so gorgeous that time of year. The week after October break, there is a bus going to Woodbury Grove. That's the 26th of October. It has a lot of outlet stores. It's very popular at this time of the year because students like to buy things for their dormitory rooms. What's an outlet store? An outlet store is a kind of discount store. Um, could you spell that? Outlet. O-U-T-L-E-T. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. So, yeah, that bus leaves at 11 p.m. and comes back at 6 p.m. All right, got it. The next weekend, on Sunday... There is a trip going down to the city, so yes, on the 3rd of November, students can visit the Museum of Contemporary Art. They have a new exhibition showing modern Chinese art. That sounds really interesting. 
How much is it? The school has a special arrangement with the museum, so it's free with your student ID. I'll definitely go to that one. When will the bus be leaving? It leaves from Lauder Hall at 12 p.m. and gets back around 9 p.m., so it will be nine hours. Wow, thanks for all the info. No problem. If you have any other questions about the off campus excursions, feel free to email me. Okay, here, I have a pen. What is it? It's paladin at mail.com. Hmm, could you spell that? Paladin, P A L A D I N, at mail.com. Thanks again. It's my pleasure. Don't worry about it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You're going to hear a talk by a tour guide about the local history of Harbour Town. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the historic downtown area of Harbortown. I'm going to give a presentation on the history of the area before I let you all go. There's great weather today, so I'll try to keep this short. So, from this room, you can see most all of the historic area. This intersection is where the city was first founded, about 350 years ago. The San Gabriel River is wide and deep, and it was an excellent waterway for the movement of goods. Harbortown used to produce lots of beef and oranges. Before the city grew, there was lots of open land for grazing and planting fruit trees. They traded these products with other towns and cities. The weather in this region is excellent for growing oranges because there are warm summers and mild winters. Citrus fruits can't survive in places where there is severe frost. At the height of citrus cultivation, there were over 500 orchards growing citrus fruit. Unfortunately, this fertile land also had lots of oil underneath it. In the rest of the country, new technology required the energy found in fossil fuels. After the first oil wells were tapped, agriculture gradually gave way to industry. The farms, orchards, and ranches that surrounded the town were replaced by new factories, cities, and roads. There is very little agriculture in the region these days, and certainly no cattle. The oil eventually ran out, of course, but other industries such as aerospace and entertainment were established. Well, that's a brief history of Harbortown. You can use one of the computer terminals available in the main office if you want more information. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. I will highlight some of the sites here just to give you an idea of what we have in the historic center of Harbortown. You can then explore the area as you please. So, I've already mentioned the intersection where the city was first founded. The main east-west street is called Sunset Road, and the main north-south street is called Santa Monica Avenue. The central office we are in right now is at the northernmost end of Santa Monica Avenue. There are public restrooms here, as well as computer terminals that connect to the Internet. 
across from the central office is the fruit market. At its height, people from all over the country came to buy fruit from the distributors there. If you travel south from the market and go past the intersection, you will see the ranch museum. Here you can learn about the old ranching lifestyle that was such a hallmark of our region. Now, going back to the intersection, if you go west of Santa Monica Avenue, you will find Old City Hall. It is an excellent example of the architecture of the time. In the opposite direction, going east of the main intersection, you can see Sunny Movie Studios. They don't make movies there now, of course, but it was the first company to make movies in our region. Also, the subway station is accessible from all four corners of the intersection. If you didn't take the bus here today, I am sure that is where you came from. Well, thanks again, and I hope you enjoy your visit to the historic area of Harbortown. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student, Kayana, and a professor about an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Hi, Dr. Reed. Are you busy right now? Do you mind if I come in for a second? Hey, Kiana. No, I don't mind at all. Thanks. I just wanted to say that I'm enjoying your Urban Studies course and that I'm having some trouble with the first assignment. OK, no problem. What do you want to ask? This is my first time writing a paper of this length. All right. What sort of trouble are you running into? Well, writing more than 10 pages is actually turning out to be quite a task. I've been rereading some of the material, and I'm just not sure how to approach the assignment. Yes, it takes some time to get used to academic writing assignments. More time than I expected, really. I also want to do a really good job on the assignment. I don't want to put a half-hearted effort into it. I'm glad to hear that. I'll say that these assignments get easier to manage as time goes on. That's a small relief. I mean, it gets easier to plan the assignment and to organize one's time but it still takes hard work and a sincere effort to produce a good piece of academic writing. My role is to guide you to the readings I think are the most relevant and to give you tips on managing your time. OK. Could we talk about the readings then? Sure. We can go over them. I guess I want to ask about the Cole House text first. It seems like a pretty interesting book. But sometimes a bit over the top, no? I would recommend reading just the first part of the book. It's the most relevant to the assignment that I gave you. The rest of the text goes on about a topic we will cover later in the semester. All right. I'll just read the intro then. As for the Peely article, oh, did you read that one? Yes, I accessed it online and then printed it out. OK. I would recommend you review that again. Also, remember what I said about the Liebskid article? I think you told the class to focus on the research methods, right? Yes. She approaches the problem in an innovative way. Let's see. For the Gary article, I think you should, let me see, I think it would be best for you to read just the conclusion. Just the conclusion, I see. Yes, I would ask you to read the whole thing, but this way would be more efficient. Speaking of which, you should not bother reading the Wolfson article. Yeah, it didn't seem particularly relevant to the topic. Let's see, any other reading you wanted to talk about? Let me see. Um, yes, the Cuddler article. What do you think of that one? Ah, yes. How could I forget? That one is pretty central to the topic. I really think you must go over it again. 
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to ask about? Yes, I wanted to ask about the line graph that you provided. It seems that the legend identifying the different parts is not there. Ah, it must not have been photocopied correctly. Here, let me explain them. They all represent percentages of the population in Manassas, OK? Line 1 here at the top is the percentage of people who were born in a foreign country. Born outside the country. OK, and this one? The next line down. Line 2 refers to the percentage of people with citizenship. All right, got it. Those making a middle class wage are represented by the fifth line down. OK, middle class wage earners. And the line number 4? That is the percentage of people with a college education or higher. All right, and the one in the middle? That one is the percentage of population who are married and have children. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. I really appreciate your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a talk on the subject of green buildings and skyscrapers. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today, I am here to talk about the construction of green buildings. Given the current state of the global environment, new types of architecture, design and construction techniques are absolutely necessary. My brief lecture today will cover two topics, what qualifies a building to receive a green certification and also how widespread such sustainable buildings currently are. There is a growing demand for so-called green buildings. Government agencies and corporations around the world understand that sustainable workplaces are quite cost-effective in the long run. Though initial outlays for construction are usually more expensive, the savings in maintenance and energy costs make up for it. Here, at the Ministry of Environmental Stewardship, we have created a detailed set of requirements that a building must pass in order to be certified as green. For buildings that have already been constructed, we offer two levels of certification, bronze and silver, depending on the number of guidelines implemented. These include reducing or recycling waste products, as well as installing efficient heating and cooling systems. For a gold certification, a building must have had sustainable and environmentally friendly practices from the beginning of its construction. Measures such as using local materials, wood grown from well-managed forests or reducing the use of toxic chemicals all contribute toward this prestigious distinction. It's pleasing to see how mainstream going green is now. Here at the Ministry, however, we know and understand that this cannot be just some passing fad. We created these guidelines so that institutions could not merely greenwash their buildings, claiming that they are environmentally friendly when in fact they aren't. I would now like to talk about some buildings that have received these special certifications. In the 60s, there was a great number of public housing projects built. Over the years, many of them have fallen into gross disrepair. As part of an urban revitalization project, construction companies have consulted with ministry experts to make those council estates a greener and healthier place to live. 
At Cabrini Fields, lead pipes and lead paint were removed, improving the health of children living there. A system of rooftop and community gardens also helped residents to support themselves. It was one of the first buildings we awarded a bronze certification to. One building with a silver certification is the Milop Jewett Tower, built over a century ago and located in the downtown area. The insides of the building were completely scooped out, allowing the construction company to implement innovative new ways of saving energy. The utility bill of the entire building is now 40% down, only 60% of its previous level, despite rising energy costs. Lastly, I would like to talk about the latest building to receive a gold certification from the Ministry. Arcadia Arbors is a really great example of green engineering and construction. From the very beginning, the project heads made a really unique plan and held to it. Many of the Ministry's guidelines were followed and we even got ideas for other ways to make buildings sustainable. The centerpiece of this skyscraper is a multi-story hanging garden that serves both an aesthetic and practical purpose. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.